this one is not a mic. No, that that's for the camera. Can you hear me okay? I'll start without it, but if you need me, if it starts being a strain, let me know, okay? Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> when, when John asked me to do this topic, um, because I had done it at NCCL, I was really excited because I love talking about Pope Francis more than anything else right now. It's just a joy, isn't it? And um, I believe in Carpe Diem. My first job out of college was as a Catholic high school religion teacher, but I taught a little English too, so Dead Poet Society with Robin Williams was a great movie for me, and he told his boys Carpe Diem, and we'll talk about that this morning. Um, so without further ado, your handout uh, is on the left side of your folder. If, if you want to bring it out, you don't need to. Just uh, most of what I'll be saying is in there just to let you know, okay? If you had to describe how you, th what, the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the words Pope Francis, what is it? Joy. Joy. Mercy. Mercy. Well, usually it isn't crying, but. <laughs> <laughs> Joy, mercy, anybody else a different? Passion. Welcoming. Welcoming. Openness. Openness. Beautiful. Yeah. I think um, we need to look at what has happened in our church and to take advantage of that in whatever ministry we're in. Most of you, faith formation, youth ministry, which has a huge piece that is faith formation, adult faith formation, what, lifelong faith formation. Let's talk first about his effect on the new evangelization. Because, you know, um, Paul VI introduced us to evangelization in the modern world, and uh, John Paul uh, introduced uh, that we need a new evangelization, and it was new in three ways, and you all know this. The first is ardor. Think about the newness that Francis brings to the ardor. He just excites people wherever he goes. And we need to have that same passion, that same excitement in our faith formation, in our ministries, don't we? That he brings. He just evokes joy and excitement in people. Part of that uh, change of ardor is he has changed the headlines finally for the Catholic Church. For many years, the headlines were about the sex abuse issues, right? He has changed it. That's not what people are talking about, even on I'll, I'll do the two spectrums, CNN or Fox News. The, you know, it, it's not about the sex abuse statistics. It's about Pope Francis for his 77th birthday invited three homeless European, Eastern European men and their dog to his birthday breakfast. That's a different type of headline. And I just think, especially now that, what, 53% of our uh, parishes are postmoderns, the younger, the Gen Xers, the millennials, and whatever the new younger generation will be called. I think my favorite one of the ones they're throwing out is the little, short, you know, small I generation, which would fit, wouldn't it? Uh, that they uh, would, would see this as an exciting time to be Catholic. And Pope Francis has given us that. So we need to seize the day, the opportunity. Uh, and a, a great way to do that will be with mercy, right? Uh, we're going to talk more about mercy this afternoon with the Jubilee year and the opportunities in faith formation, adult faith formation, any age group for that. I, I love the logo that was chosen, don't you, for the Jubilee year of mercy. It just says it all. The second thing that John Paul said was new about evangelization was in the method, right? The methodology that we use. And this for us, doing faith formation, has to be so important. And so what method did Francis propose? Creating a culture of encounter. I love that, don't you? That we need to create both uh, two types of encounters, right? One is our encounter with God. And the other is our encounter with each other. And of course, he always reminds us the each other, especially for him, and his heart beats for those on the margins. And that has to say a lot to us in ministry, that we cannot be content with the people who come. We always have to ask, but who's not here? Even if we have a lot of people. I think 
Francis is so good about building on, you know, standing on the shoulders of his predecessors. And in Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel, he said, I never get tired of quoting my predecessor, Pope Benedict, who said, being a Christian is not just an ethical choice or a lofty idea. Pope Benedict said it is an encounter with an event, the Paschal Mystery, right, and uh, the person of Jesus Christ. So it's not that, that uh, Francis is claiming credit for this idea. He is building uh, on what his predecessors have said. He says it's about making God's love more real in people's lives, making it concrete. I think sometimes we worry, um, I'm going to skip one and come back to it, that we're going, are we going back to the deja vu, you know, the 70s warm fuzzy faith where we maybe threw the baby out with the bathwater for a while after Vatican II. We knew the old Baltimore catechism method that worked for me in the 1950s no longer worked because we weren't living in a Christocentric culture anymore. I think about my upbringing and how different it was. You know, Dyersville, AKA Field of Dreams, Iowa, um, one of its unique claims to fame was that we were really Catholic. There were 2,500 people in Dyersville when I was growing up and 2,499 were Catholic. <laughs> and Mr. Armstrong was married to a Catholic, so he blended right in. And we did not have a public school when I was growing up because everybody sent their kids to the Catholic school. Our farmhouse was decorated Catholic. You know, you walked in the door and you knew you were in a Catholic home. Immaculate Heart of Mary, Sacred Heart of Jesus in Mom and Dad's bedroom, big Last Supper in the kitchen, uh, holy water font going up the stairs to the bedrooms. It, it, it was that way. Uh, but what Francis has done is to say, Today, it's deeper than just warm, fuzzy, Jesus loves, loves me um, faith. He said it's really entering deeply into the pain and the sacrifice that true love can, can bring. A love that is constant. It's not just enthusiasm. So he is saying, I'm not saying it's that shallow or superficial approach. It is deep. And it is God's love embodied in reality. Don't you love that, how he talks about that? And he lives it. You know, one of the things that when I work in youth ministry, one of the deadliest sin sins for teenagers is what? Adult hypocrisy, right? Ooh, you know, they don't respect adults who say one thing and do another. And uh, I just think Francis never says anything that he doesn't himself live going to the margins, whatever it might be. You know, the day he went uh, into the room to talk to th over 300 people in wheelchairs. Now, he's not young. I have a bad back. But he bent over and talked to each one of the 300. Can you imagine what his back felt like at the end of that day? But he wanted to encounter them with that personal message. The third thing that St. John Paul encouraged us to have new about evangelization was its expression, right? And look what Pope Francis expresses. He declares a jubilee year of mercy that obviously for him, that's an important expression of faith. How much God loves us, or as he said, this one, my favorite of his quotes, God never tires of forgiving us. Never gets sick of it. Never tires of forgiving us. So those kinds of things. Or the way he talks about joy, right? Now, I, or the Diocese of Camden, the credit, they counted up the number of times certain words were used in the joy of the gospel. Look at 154 times he used the word love. And joy was the second. The poor were third. It shows where his heart is, right? And where our hearts should be, too. And, you know, I think the question is, do we weave that into our faith formation as, as uh, DREs or whatever our responsibility might be? I think that he, it, it shows the encounter so beautifully in the way he always looks for what can I have in common with the people I am with. And when that young couple came to the Vatican with their wedding clothes on and they were professional clowns, they gave him a clown nose and he put it right on. 
because he wanted to say, you know, here's some, a, a way in which I can connect with you. Sometimes, you know, I think I'm too old. Like, I, I still program direct our mission trip for high schoolers in the summer. And sometimes by the end of the week, the air mattress is comfortable. It's getting out of it and rolling on the floor and finding, now how do I get up from here? That gets harder every year for me. But then I think, you know, can I find ways of connecting with these high schoolers who might look at me and say, I don't know, she almost is older than my grandma, you know. But I think they find that intriguing sometimes. So, you know, you find a way to connect, which is what Francis did. Bishop Caggiano, and those of you in youth ministry probably recognize him because he is the uh, moderator, or the Episcopal moderator for the National Federation for Catholic Youth Ministry. And he recently did a MOOC um, for youth ministers in which he said, you know, we always talk about the, the uh, head, heart, hands, and feet. All you catechetical people know that really well that we can't just be cognitive, it's affective and behavioral too. But he said, Pope Francis has challenged us to add a fourth, and that is community. You know, does our parish radiate the joy of the gospel? You know, is the parish itself an avenue through which people learn their Catholic identity and all the wonderful things that we stand for as Catholics? So I think the first challenge I want to make to you and to myself in applying the, the Pope Francis effect in our individual parishes is, do we spend too much focusing on the trees and not enough time focusing on the forest? And what do I mean by that? We can't just focus on our individual programs. That we will miss the boat on some really important things. If I, I just say, well, I have this coming up, I have this coming up, I have these logistics to attend to, all the organizational things. But first we need to say, how transformative is our parish? Is our parish life giving? And before anyone says, you know, um, that's not my job, Pope Francis said we are called to show that the church is the home for everyone. We sing it, don't we? All are welcome. We sing that at Mass. But are there any people who feel less welcome? And I think that's part of Francis' passion leading to the ordinary synod after the extraordinary synod on the family. He certainly seems to be talking a lot about everyone feeling welcome, be they divorced, be they whomever, right? That they would feel that. And do we communicate that church? to bring warmth and stirring hearts. You've got to love it. Uh, he, he talks a lot about that. So questions, the big questions. How does your parish provide encounters with Jesus Christ? Not just in faith formation, although of course that's part of it, but in every aspect of parish life are people encountering Jesus. The Eucharist would of course be the source and the summit for that. But it's beyond that, you know, it, 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 it is the Eucharist sending us out uh, at the end of Mass to do it in every aspect of parish life. Second big question, and this is Pope Francis' terminology, how are we forming missionary disciples? We'll talk more about that today. But that should be our ultimate goal. How are we, in whatever we're doing in youth ministry, adult faith formation, uh, with the five-year-olds, with the 15, with the... 55 year olds and the 80 year olds how are we forming missionary disciples and how are we building bridges between what the catholic church says and people living their ordinary lives at home at work you know um, in the marketplace recreating whatever they're doing how do we make the catholic church relevant and as pope francis says how are we connecting with the marginalized, whoever they might be? They might be those immigrants that you were talking about. They might be uh, uh, a lost 21-year-old soul, whatever it might be. So at your tables, I'm going to ask you, are you asking the bigger questions? And in order for that to be true, we cannot say that's not my job because we can't afford the silo mentality. 
if we don't work together, all the people, you know, in leadership in the parish, from father to the parish secretary, from the janitor to the DRE, from the youth minister to the sacramental prep person, from RCIA to uh, Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, all of those have to be included, right? And we can't say, that's not my job. So um, talk to each other. How do you create opportunities for asking the bigger questions? And do you ask the big questions? And what other big questions might there be for your parish through the lens of Pope Francis? Talk to each other.